A very warm welcome, my dear colleagues from, and participants from all over the world, for our online exchange today on mental health and psychosocial support in Latin America and the Caribbean, addressing the consequences of gender-based violence and displacement. My name is Marcio Galeato. I am a mental health professional from Brazil, connecting from Sao Paulo, the co-director of the Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Network. I would like also to welcome, in the name of our six hosts today, the European Commission's Dictorate General for European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation, the Interagency Standing Committee on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Reference Group, and the MHPSS.net. We are here today because we would like to shed light on the Latin America and the Caribbean region, exchanging the many good practices that we have from the local practitioners and discussing how a joint effort can ensure that the policy space is strengthened for high quality mental health and psychosocial support interventions along the intersections between MHPSS, displacement, and gender-based violence. To just give you a short overview of what we, we are going to have in the next two hours, we have about 14 persons, 15 to be more specific, uh, that will be uh, discussing uh, and we will have different contributions uh, under, those, under the two main panels uh, aspects on MHPSS and gender-based violence and the second one on MHPSS and displacement and mixed migration. Um, feel free to, to use the chat that you have access uh, uh, in your screen on the right side. Uh, do use this chat space uh, to introduce yourself, uh, say your name, where you are connecting from, uh, and also to pose your comments and questions. During these uh, two hours presentations and discussions, we will be collecting the questions from the audience and from the participants, and, uh, and then we will have a dedicated space, not so long, I must say, but a dedicated space where we are going to take your questions to, to, to the presenters and to the panel presenters. Um, uh, I also uh, uh, I also would like just to inform that everyone that this event is being recorded, and uh, for my colleagues uh, uh, presenters here, uh, uh, I, I would just uh, remind you to keep uh, your yourself muted when you are not speaking, and please be mindful of time when speaking as well. So, to make uh, the welcome remarks uh, for the presentation now, I would like to, to introduce uh, uh, the two speakers here, um, uh, Mrs. Andrea Coleman, who is the director for the Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin American, Caribbean, and Mrs. Cristina Gutierrez Hernandez from the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation, who is the director for Humanitarian Affairs. Thank you so much for two of you for being here today, and uh, I, I pass over to you for the initial remarks, starting perhaps by you, uh, Mrs. Cristina Gutierrez Hernandez. Yes, hello, I hope you can hear me. Well, a very good afternoon to those who are on this side of the ocean, and a very good morning to those who are on the other side of the ocean. I am delighted to be participating in this seminar. I think that it will help us to tackle a very important problem which requires a very specific and high quality approach and I'm hopeful that today's session will give us examples of how to carry out high quality work in this area. Internal displacement and forced migration are very relevant for mental health and can have a major impact on the individual, the family, a community, society. They can generate a lot of psychological ill ease, emotional consequences, consequences physically in the body, which can also have a, a major impact on the day-to-day -day lives of the individuals concerned. There's a lot of stress throughout a migration process, a long and difficult voyage before the individual reaches their destination, a lot of abuse, 
by gangs of criminals who are pursuing profit. So these terrible conditions of discrimination and abuse, injury, lack of services, trauma, lack of access to basic services during the migratory process. And these traumatic experiences which a person may have, first of all, in their place of origin, secondly, as a result of migratory politics, mean that these are people who are highly vulnerable. Let's add on to that the fact that they have a total lack of certainty about their futures. These are people who leave their homes behind, become separated from their families. They lose sight of any plans that they might have had for the rest of their lives. And this has consequences for both the physical and mental health of displaced individuals. As a result, these people are exposed to high levels of stress and traumatic experiences. And that generates psychological suffering. And they will only be able to overcome that depending on their own capacity for individual resilience, how they deal with difficulties, support from the family, from a group within society, from people that they can lean on as they migrate. But that is often not the case. And increasingly, we are seeing that we need to pay close attention to mental health and psychosocial support throughout the migration process. We're talking about desperate people. In some cases, a lot of restrictions are placed on these people as well. And so what we see is that many people who are in transit or are being returned are supported by civil society, international humanitarian organisations that are providing humanitarian support to cover their basic needs. And they also focus on health as well as the mental health of displaced people. The Spanish Agency for Inter International Cooperation does include mental health and psych psychosocial support as part of its work, in particular as part of its humanitarian work, where that is linked to displacement and gender-based violence in the Latin American and Caribbean regions. We have a strategy. It's been in place. It's in place for 2022, 2023 and will run for five years, gives priority to physical and socioeconomic injury to those who are displaced and also focus on, focuses on victims of gender-based violence, including sexual violence. It hones in in particular on women and children from refugee families, people who are in transit and are being returned, those from the LGBTQI community and other vulnerable people. The Spanish presidency just got off the ground uh, three days ago. We will be presiding the working group in the council called COAFA, which focuses on humanitarian action and food security. And as part of its presidency, Spain will be focusing in particular on the gender aspect of humanitarian aid, looking at prevention, how we respond to problems, eradicating gender-based violence in a whole host of different situations, including armed conflict and displacement, refugee situations as well. And we'll be focusing on MHPSS as part of that overall strategy of best practices which we would like to bring to the table for a proper debate during our six month presidency. So loads of challenges, many obstacles that we face as part of this topic. What we need is a multidisciplinary approach. MHPSS should be part and parcel of an overall response coming from different sectors, looking at protection, health, education as well. In addition to that, MHPSS is part of all three different pillars of our network. It's a shared responsibility from civil society, organisations, host communities, countries of origin, countries of transit. And so we need to reach out to all of those different countries that are concerned as a person moves from country to country. They have to have access to mental health and psychosocial support services. 
these services also have to bear in mind the linguistic and cultural and societal diversity of the people they are dealing with and be sensitive to that. So we need to make sure that they, we build capacity, that there are resources to deal with the specific problems that they face. Particularly, we need to support local organisations. We hope that this seminar will give us some answers to some of the challenges that I've set out for you and will certainly enable us all to learn from one another and improve the level of quality of the strategies that we need. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Cristina Gutierrez, for, for the, your kind contributions on, on this opening remark. And now I pass uh, the, the word for you, Mrs. Andrea Kulema. Thank you very much for being here today. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, I was thanking uh, Dr. Gagliato for his introduction and thanking also Cristina for presenting very eloquently the psychological and mental impact of humanitarian uh, crisis on on on, uh, on on the well-being of individuals um, and as well i would like to uh, to wish you all the best for this upcoming presidency uh, of the of the, of the european union um, dear participants dear colleagues dear partners it is a pleasure to join you in this webinar on mental health and psycho psychosocial support in latin america and the caribbean uh, the European Commission's Director General for um, for Humanitarian uh, Assistance, in short, DG ECHO, is very happy to convene this event together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation, as well as the uh, Interagency Standing Committee, MHPSS Reference Group, as well as MHPSS.net. Um, this is an expression of Team Europe in uh, the way we are looking at this uh, at this program. Uh, it started with Germany and the Netherlands. I'm very pleased that now the, it's enlarged also to, uh, to Spain. And it builds on a common endeavor which started over a year ago when we launched the first webinar of this series, which explored MHPSS in the Middle East. So why is it important? Why is this series important? It is important because MHPSS is an essential dimension of individual health and social resilience. And I think Christina very much uh, uh, described what, the kind, what kind of impact uh, would take place in, for example, situations of displacement. Um, in the wake of the COVID-19, MHPSS has fortunately received increasing attention, and that is something which is positive. Um, however, there's still a way to go to act uh, better and more collectively, uh, raising awareness, strengthening coordination in different contexts, increasing local capacity building, and sharing best practices. And in an endeavor to share best practices, I would like to transmit to you the three main conclusions which were formulated during our past exchanges on MPA, MHPSS in the context of the MENA region. Um, there were three, uh, three main points. The first one was providing quality mental health and psychosocial support services for individuals and communities in line with international standards, such as the minimum service package developed by the ES Questions Group. The second conclusion was acting along the entire humanitarian development peace nexus to support local capacity building and skills development and to support affected people to vision opportunities and to actually env envisage their future. And the third uh, conclusion was conducting more research for evidence-based interventions and then implement uh, the results of that research in a coordinated uh, manner. For DG ECHO, MHPSS remains a priority across the geography. It isn't an integral part of our response to humanitarian crisis uh, worldwide. Um, in the past four years, uh, if I now look at uh, a focus more on Latin America, we have allocated um, over 100 million to support MHPSS activities globally. And out of that, almost 20 million were directed to Latin America and the Caribbean in response to major crises in Colombia, Venezuela, followed by Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, and others. Today, we will hear from our partners, experts, practitioners in the regions about the links between MHPSS, gender-based violence, and displacement and discuss how services uh, that are local, accessible, culturally sensitive can be promoted. Because although it is a concern across the globe to have 
solid mental health and psychosocial support. The details of it and the way it is implemented has to be adjusted to the realities of the affected populations as well as the context in which they are evolving. So today our discussion is very timely in view of upcoming events uh, which put uh, Latin America on our uh, on the agenda. Uh, for instance, the EU CELAC summit in July here in Brussels, the fifth global mental health summit in Argentina in October, and the global refugee summit in December. As we know, people affected by conflict, violence, and displacement are amongst the most exposed to trauma, which ultimately affect their mental health and psychosocial well-being in several ways. And unfortunately, the Latin America and Caribbean region is one of the most disaster-prone and violent regions in the world, marked by pervasive challenges such as gender-based violence, armed conflict, and displacement. Our partners make sure to provide quality MHPSS to those in most vulnerable situations, such as migrants in internally displaced people, returnees, people with disabilities and their caregivers, indigenous populations, victims of trafficking and violence, including sexual and gender-based violence. And they attempt to provide that quality response in a truly intersectional approach. For example, at the Colombian-Venezuelan border, migrant populations, uh, Colombian IDPs, as well as returnees in host communities, are receiving support in terms of sexual and reproductive health, medication, and, and MHPSS. In Central America and in Mexico, another project uh, funded by ECHO focuses on gender-based violence and child migrant protection needs, reducing education barriers and strengthening MHPSS coordination. With this event today, we aim to strengthen the understanding and coordination about MHPSS needs and responses in the LAC region, increase the attention related to different contexts, and start a dialogue for joint action, bringing ever closer local, national, and international actors. I would like to thank all the speakers that will be joining today, experts and donors who have agreed to share their insight, and I would like to thank them also for their incredible work on the ground. I wish you all an instructive and enriching experience change in the coming two hours. Thank you so much, uh, um, Mrs. Andrea, for, for these um, um, uh, opening remarks. Um, thank you both of you for, for, for welcoming this event, making this possible as well, fostering these discussions in the, in the Latin American and Caribbean region, which I think uh, it has been such a, an important, uh, uh, it is an important uh, um, event that should be taking place in, in our region. Um, I, I, I'm very sorry for the problem that some people there are having with the translation. I see many people are having this issue. Let me just say that uh, lo lamento mucho este problema con la traducción. Yes, I'm very sorry with the um, about the problem with the interpretation. Colleagues are working on it, and uh, it will be resolved as soon as possible. So, of course. Um, we will move on directly to uh, questions. First of all, relating to um, mental health and psychosocial support. It's, um, it's ready. I will ask my colleagues to let me know. Um, I also want to, to acknowledge the participants we have here across the globe, but especially so many people from Latin America, Colombia, Argentina, Haiti, Venezuela, uh, Jamaica, um, and also people from overseas, Spain, Sri Lanka, you are very welcome here. Um, introducing our first panel, uh, we would like to explore the intersection of gender and violence in Latin America and Caribbean countries. According to the latest Global Humanitarian Overview of this year, Latin America and Caribbean is not only the second most disaster-prone region globally, but also one of the most violent. Shockingly, within the region, 14 out of the 25 countries have the highest rates of feminicide, and six countries account for 81% of the global cases of sexual and gender-based violence. Moreover, intersectionality plays a crucial role in understanding how violence affects different groups, individuals with disabilities, local populations, and members of the LGBTQI plus community face distinct challenges in relation to violence. So now at this discussion, we aim to shed some light on, on, on some of those critical issues, their underlying factors, 
and the potential solutions. Um, thank you for for the for the panel uh, speakers. I I'm happy to welcome uh, and introduce uh, the three of you. Um, Urban Aguilar Yepes from Tinta Violeta, uh, connecting from Venezuela. Monica Limiares Hernandez uh, from ASPIDH in El Salvador. And Maria Cristobal from Hayas. Good to see you. Welcome. Uh, can you all hear me in Spanish by now? Uh, can you hear the translation? Yeah? Oh, it's working again? Oh, excellent. So, Welcome for the three of you um, for this exciting discussion. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Um, my first question perhaps uh, to you, uh, Urban Aguilar Yepes from Tinta Violeta. The Latin America and Caribbean region, while uh, demonstrating remarkable resilience and cultural vi vibrancy, also confronts complex issues such as various forms of violence and inequalities, including gender-based violence and human trafficking, which disproportionately impacts women and girls. Tinta Violeta is working in Venezuela. Can you give us some examples to understand the critical function and significance of mental health and psychosocial support for survivors of human trafficking? Thank you, and over to you. Microphone, please. Please Good turn job. on your mic. Okay. Gracias. Bien, bueno. Well, um, hello. Um, as uh, you've heard, I'm from Tinta Violeta in uh, Venezuela. I'm a psychologist. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for inviting us to this meeting. And uh, it's nice to um, be able to participate in this uh, virtually and say hello to all the people present um, virtually. Now, my... Um, contribution will be looking at uh, the uh, stru the structural problems which um, create issues for gender violence in Venezuela. They're very similar to those faced in all countries of the world. In particular, civil society and institutions who are responsible for legislating um, should be t paying attention to and, and penalizing um, uh, and taking responsibility to prevent gender-based violence and yet there are cultural elements and subjective elements which um, mean that this violence is continuing without huge changes and we're seeing um, huge uh, cases of um, gender-based violence happening every day. The statistics um, Ask, call upon us to sort of pay attention to this, and they're growing every day. The statistical, uh, the statistics, which are obtained by the centralised institutions, are not in the public domain, so we have to get them from um, private institutions. There's also a socio-economic crisis which our country is facing, and that has mean, meant that people are more vulnerable. Um, it's increased frustration and violence, and we've also seen a, a lot of qualified people leaving the country and leaving uh, public service. Um, human trafficking is a, a problem beyond the theory, and um, we're seeing that uh, people from our own country are being um, uh, kidnapped within the country and also outside, and we're seeing victims of trafficking from all over. Unfortunately, the sound is breaking up. There are two main uh, geographic areas where we see um, uh, victims being taken from the national um, territory. This is Sucre, Deta, Amakuro, and Anzuategui. Um, they go towards the um, islands of the Caribbean, particularly Trinidad and uh, Tobago. And there are also um, uh, vessels for prostitution and trafficking in international waters. And then the second destination is Apore, 
Tachira, and people heading to Colombia. Women, girls, boys and adolescents um, who are trafficked came, come above all from Caracas, Miranda, Anduategui and Bolivar. Um, we have seen that people are um, uh, caught up in this by being offered um, jobs that don't exist. Uh, sometimes they're um, robbed, they're captured. Um, sometimes um, women leave on, of their own accord to look for better socioeconomic conditions. Sometimes uh, men supposedly fall in love with them and offer them uh, a life in another country and then sell them to the traffickers. Are uh, people in very precarious socioeconomic um, conditions. Many of them end up um, in Colombia as prostitutes, where they're often um, captured and um, turned into uh, slaves. There are also um, many uh, who go to Chile, Peru, and Spain. And Spain is the gateway to Europe. Now, with regard to the uh, critical importance of mental health and psychosocial support for survivors of uh, gender-based violence and trafficking is something which we are working on in Tinta Violeta and we've uh, gained a lot of experience in this. We take an integral approach and we talk about loving care. Um, our uh, critical perspective is um, feminist. We look at human rights, um, it's generational. We look at disability, ethnicity, um, gender diversity, um, class diversity, and um, we take a loving approach. This is um, central to the name of our um, approach. Now, um, just to keep it short and simple, I'll focus in particular on this last aspect. With a loving approach, we try to help people who we consider to be our equals, and we also um, help them following the uh, grammatical significance of a moro, the Spanish for uh, love, which means that there are no moral obligations, no debts incurred, and we respect the uh, decisions taken um, of, by the people that we're helping. The principles in order to carry out this um, uh, approach are that we respect confidentiality, we focus on the needs of the user, um, showing approval, empathy and respect uh, with honesty and clarity, um, showing humility, working quickly and without prejudice. The whole of um, this uh, complement of the people concerned um, is focused on advising uh, providing psychosocial support in individual and group support, um, emergency shelters in the case of um, high risk or um, the risk to physical integrity, and we train them in feminism, critical theory about the patriarchy, um, uh, structural violence against women, and um, people of diverse um, gender identity, and uh, we provide references references where necessary in terms of physical health training for um, work and living and monetary help where we can sometimes um, the uh, survivors of human trafficking um, need um, support for longer they need um, housing in order to start the action that is required for them to be incorporated into um, the uh, labor market and um, also to help them with housing and uh, to ensure that they have a, a legal status in the country and also to make it easier for them to go back voluntary to, voluntarily to their country of origin or um, transferred to the place where they will end up living in our country. 
This has been the center of the interest of our um, meeting relating to psychosocial attention for uh, such people. Yes, making people aware of the fact that they belong to the feminine gender and the constitutive elements of feminine subjectivity, thinking about um, this uh, within the patriarchal society, um, problems relating to maternity, um, de-problematizing sexuality, participation of women in the public um, sphere, uh, construction of multiple desires, discovery and validating um, their own capacities and becoming aware of symbolic and real violence in which are present in society and in um, uh, couples. Strategies for empowerment and for allowing them to take control of their own lives. At the moment, we uh, focus on support for victims of um, violence and try to overcome the gaps in order to provide greater support for survivors. And we look at the particular situation of the individuals. There are uh, many issues with this. I'll perhaps just to point out a number of these and uh, look at uh, interference as well and suggest what we think would be a way of making it uh, easier to uh, address these properly. For example, um, problems with the uh, support for victims. Here we have, for example, uh, violence considered as a valid way of resolving conflict as part of uh, the traditional masculine identity. In order to address this, we are suggesting that there should be massive awareness raising campaigns on a continuous and sustained basis in order to um, make this uh, questionable, question the um, hierarchy of genders. And then we have this situation where um, institutions are weak, they don't have budgets and they don't have enough um, qualified staff. For this, we need to um, build stronger institutions with proper budgets, um, with national plans and with people managing them who are really committed, supervised and where we have um, ongoing training and sufficient um, wages. Then there's a problem of overcoming a crisis intervention in case of gender based violence. For this, we need to implement development policies which focus on uh, subjective empowerment and socio-economic empowerment of the um, survivors and their families. And then we have um, problems with the uh, legal systems, the health systems, the labour systems, uh, housing, education and communication. Here we have to have integral cross-cutting interventions um, between the different institutions in order to uh, fight gender-based violence. Without a real understanding of this and a cross-cutting approach, um, we'll only be able to um, uh, address this uh, social scourge. Um, with, without all of these um, changes, it will just be a drop in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Urbin uh, Aguilaria Pes, for the, the presentation, for your uh, points. Um, I, I will pass now inviting you, uh, Maria Cristobal from Hayas. Uh, I would just uh, kindly of ask the, the, the speakers if they can uh, uh, perhaps uh, 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 give some more shortened answers. Um, and, uh, and uh, from you, Mrs. Cristobal, uh, I would like to ask in the specific context of Mexico, why is the provision of MHPSS to GBV, uh, gender-based violence survivors, is so important? Uh, and what are the specific challenges HIAS is facing while providing MHPSS services in Mexico? Thank you so much for being here today. Muchas gracias, Marcio. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure to talk with you and I'm delighted to meet my two colleagues, Aguilar and Monica. UNHCR 
has programmes for MHPSS, as do other organisations covering 10 uh, countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, including some of the most complicated regions as part of the migration crisis that is currently uh, rocking our region. Mexico receives a tremendous number of asylum requests. More than 18,000, more than 18,000 people have applied from many different countries. And those displaced people in Mexico are exposed to many different factors for their mental and psychosocial health. There's violence in Mexico, often extreme violence, gender-based violence, and it's a, a daily constant for those who are migrating. Often families are separated, there's a great deal of uncertainty, difficulties faced by families and individuals just to basically meet their most basic needs. In addition to that, uncertainty about their migration status. Sometimes they are held for a long time in detention centres in inhumane conditions. And we have very restrictive, often punitive migration policies which generate a lot of anxiety and this in turn carries risks. Women children and those from the LGBTQI plus community are disproportionately affected by these circumstances and that is why against that backdrop early identification and adequate responses to mental health problems including action taken such as promotion and prevention are so important. IS was talking about the challenges of implementing MHPSS programmes in Mexico. These are manifold. I'd like to focus in on three. First of all, the US and its recent policy on Title 42 and also the disinformation that has been widespread. This is causing chaos, despair, a lot of rumours, people are taking ill-informed decisions and this is pushing people to make choices that are highly risky and are exposing them to high levels of risk. Secondly, a lack of specialist services and this is particularly important for those who have severe mental health conditions and those who are survivors of gender-based violence are part of that group. In 2022, Mexico updated its general health law to guarantee universal access to community mental health services, expressly referring to migrants and victims of gender-based violence, amongst others. But implementing those new rules in practice is taking a long time. It's very slow and there are major obstacles to people actually getting access to those services in the field. Those can be economic barriers, administrative barriers, whether or not the health services have enough human resources or resources available. And there's also a problem of information and trust for those people who are displaced, they don't always have the right level of trust to actually reach out to health services. And finally, in Mexico specifically, there is a tremendous amount of work that still needs to be done in terms of taking account of MHPSS across the board as a multidisciplinary approach. If we consider people who are in transit and in particular survivors of GBV, they are offered services, but sometimes this actually makes their situation worse. They lose uh, the sense of having control over what they're doing. It can expose them to um, increased vulnerability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Cristobal. I appreciate uh, uh, your valid uh, and insightful points. I. Uh, I, I want to, before moving to you, Monica, I, I want to also mention something that I forgot to mention at the beginning. We have here a very special um, um, moment, which is uh, uh, this whole conversation that is a graphic recorder. Teresa Martinez Aledo, uh, so many greetings to you, Teresa. She's uh, here from the very beginning, uh, taking, um, listening to all of you and making, transforming all this to the graphic uh, design. Uh, and at the end, uh, this will be shown to everyone. And I'm sure, as I have seen this work before, it's extremely impressive. It's a translation of uh, all our insightful points. 
um, into a visual graphic. Thank you, uh, Teresa Martinez, for doing so. So um, let me go then to to you. Uh, welcome you, uh, Mrs. Monica Linares Hernandez. Uh, from ASPIGH, uh, working specifically with the LGBTIQI plus community in El Salvador. May I ask you, what are the specific needs um, from the mental health and psychosocial support perspective that the community you are working with uh, uh, have and how you are addressing them? Thank you very much. Hola, buenos días. Yes, hello. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I come from Aspit in El Salvador. And this um, is an association that works for um, human rights of LGBTQI plus people, particularly trans um, uh, individuals. Now, um, I want to talk about why um, this is such an important tool for trans individuals and particularly for LGBTQI um, uh, people. In El Salvador, um, gender-based violence um, isn't even recognized in the case of trans women because there is a certain amount of machism, um, um, machism um, which the uh, colleagues spoke about as well. And um, it's said that um, this isn't recognised um, as um, gender-based violence because we're not talking about um, uh, feminine uh, gender. Now, in the case of uh, the pandemic, the LGBTQI community was very badly affected, particularly trans um, individuals. And it's not possible for them to uh, live without a psychosocial and mental health support, which give them the opportunity to talk about um, the issues and um, address the issues which they face during the uh, pandemic, not just um, uh, violence within the family, because uh, these individuals had to stay within their houses all the time because of lockdown, and uh, during the pandemic and following the pandemic, the problems are persisting because many of these um, LGBT um, I, uh, individuals um, don't have access to uh, employment. Um, it's not possible for them to, to open their own businesses, etc. These were issues before the pandemic, but now, for example, we um, see that the, uh, the institutions for um, psychosocial support are, are looking into this, are looking at legal advice and, uh, in order to provide information on how to identify um, those um, who are uh, uh, assaulting them, uh, various other issues of health nature, etc. And then there's a very political topic as well, which is... Uh, um, interesting in this context, uh, which caused a, a lot of uh, violence for families and um, uh, trans individuals because um, they were victims of uh, the uh, structures, criminal structures in the country. And uh, the system which we have at the moment is seeing a huge increase in violence perpetrated by members of uh, organized criminal groups. And uh, often as well, it's um, uh, official groups in uniform who are supposed to be looking after people in general, but who are perpetrating um, uh, violence here. And um, the uh, LGBT um, I um, community and um, trans individuals are victims of this. And we also see forced um, uh, migration um, affecting these people. We've heard from many Cristobal, the number of people that are being um, 
welcomed by their country. Many of them come from El Salvador. And we also have people in El Salvador who are coming from other countries uh, in Latin America who are also facing other types of violence, but who uh, come now to El Salvador. They consider that it's a, a country which is uh, viable for asking for shelter. But at the same time, we have LGBTQI um, people from our country who are um, uh, trying to leave because they are uh, subject uh, to violence, including from um, institutions, and um, they're also victims of the extortion. And um, this is uh, something which is linked to members of um, criminal gangs. So we have a lot of um, statistics relating to violence, um, but um, one aspect which is not um, covered within this is that um, there's no recognition of the statistics for this particular community. Dear Monica, thank you so much uh, for for being uh, for your points uh, so relevant and at the same time for being mindful of the time. Um, unfortunately, I need you to, to play that uh, hard role uh, of keeping the time. Uh, thank you, the three of you, for 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 being uh, um, uh, the, the voice of Latin America, uh, so important in critical issues. And now I would like to invite uh, for the conclusion remarks. My, uh, on this first panel, my dear colleague uh, Carmen, Carmen Valle, uh, who is the, uh, uh, the co-chair of the Interagency Standing Committee Reference Group on MHPSS, uh, also the, a member of the IFRC. Uh, welcome, Carmen. Good to see you, and, uh, and thank you for, for making the conclusions of this first panel. Thank you so much, Marcio. Really good to see you too, dear. Really good to see so many dear colleagues. Voy a pasar al español en un segundito, but first I would really like to thank all of the other co-organizers of these sessions for allowing this focus on the, on the region of the Americas, which is extremely important. Um, compañeros, muchas gracias por... Colleagues, thank you very much to you for this fantastic first session. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for today's meeting. Going all the way back to 2007, we have known that MHPSS is essential in humanitarian contexts. In particular, when it comes to contexts of war, and this is very particularly relevant to me in my role within the IASC. But it has taken us a bit more time to recognise the specificities of this humanitarian support. COVID gave that a boost, in fact, as some of you have mentioned in your presentations. And what we want now is to guarantee visibility, that we have the resources we need, that we have the capacity to respond to all of the different mental health and psychosocial problems that can arise whenever there is a humanitarian crisis. In a region such as that of Latin America and the Caribbean, it's important that we don't just zoom out to those large scale needs, but also that we zoom in on resources. This is a region that already has a wealth of knowledge of community-based uh, distribution of services. It's a region of the world in which there is a tremendous amount of Indigenous know-how already. So it's important for us to have sessions like this one today where we recognise the work that is being done by organisations such as those that you represent. Monica, for example, you demonstrated to us that this work is already being done by these local organisations. And what we heard from HIAS also showed us that there, there's excellent cooperation between local grassroots organisations and international organisations doing work across the entire region. You mentioned many points that I think are particularly important. First and foremost, what uh, Jurbin said in her presentation, the feminist approach when it comes to gender-based violence. I think it's very important that we've heard that comment from a local grassroots organisation that is supporting women directly. And you talked about uh, loving care. 
and that all of the services you provided are anchored in that loving care. And I think that's a different way of describing what we would call the do no harm principle, which is one we apply at the level of international organisations. So I think that's a kind of mi mirror image. It's a very lovely mirror image of the work that you're doing on mental health and GBV and how important it is for has, us to start from that as our point of departure, that we do no harm and that we focus on those survivors themselves and what they truly need and desire. So this is a, a first po focal point on gender-based violence. And another point that uh, Jurbin made, which I think is very important, is she encouraged us to think about MHPSS not just as a direct response to well-being needs or welfare needs for those who are in a situation of here specifically gender-based violence but also something that can actually facilitate let's say a return to work integration into society and a whole host of other things so mental health and psychosocial support isn't just an answer to something it's also a springboard which enables people to access other important areas of their life and coordination is another point that was mentioned by you've been I think that's very important and and that's uh, I very much identify with that and what's that's why I'm so grateful to you for having raised this point moving on now to Maria from Hayas there were a couple of very important points you made first of all early identification and rapid attention I think that's part of this overall focus and how we determine how we can earmark more resources for Latin America we shouldn't wait if a situation has already occurred and a response is needed we need to act straight away not wait for resources we need to make sure that resources already are already available for early uh, identification of a situation so that we can act straight away so that we're not just trying to catch up all the time and we're even preparing we're preparing the groundwork before something happens and all three of you also made the point about uh, multiple different layers in these situations armed conflict gender-based violence uh, mixed migration the climate crisis it's a really multifaceted situation often. We can't just go in, come out, and we've solved it. We need to be paying attention to what's happening on a permanent basis. Maria, you made many comments, and you talked in particular about how important policy is, that we have politics that have the right impact on people's well-being. And sometimes politics mean that the services are not available and we can't implement things in practice, we don't have the right level of visibility. So we need to have policies that support MHPSS and can actually be implemented in practice. That applies to community-based services and specialist services as well. And then finally, turning to Monica, some very significant points that you made there, not just because you talked about the reality of the needs for specialist services for LGBTQI plus people, in particular uh, trans women. That was the context that you were describing for us. But I think when I was listening to Monica, something I also found very important in what she said was this link, once again, between that situation and people who are in transit. So it's another layer of complexity. MHPSS has to be provided to people in that region where often you've got a country that is receiving migrants and migrants are also leaving that very same country or indeed you have internal displacement within the country itself and so I think it was very important that Monica called to mind the complexity of that situation because any MHPSS action that we take we need to we'll need to focus on the local level the regional level and also we'll need to keep an eye on the different flows of people where are they going where are they coming from very important in that region I can see that Matthew would like me to conclude so I will so I just wanted to say very simply that because there are all of those different links, which we heard from all three. All three of our speakers talked about displacement and gender based violence is very much part and parcel of displacement. And that's why I'm so pleased that in our next panel discussion, we're going to go into a little bit more depth on how displacement is impacting that region. Thank you, Matthew, for giving me an extra couple of minutes. And thank you to all three speakers for fantastic presentations. <laughs>
Not at all, Carmen. Thank you so much. Uh, and you know, you, because you also have this position many, many times in how hard it is to keep, uh, to be loyal with the time. No? So thank you for that. Thank you for the remarkable points of conclusion for this panel first. And it's really great to have you here as well. Um, I, I also, bef before I go and I move to the panel too, we are going to have a quick show of the, the graphic design. Um, and just before we go there, I just want to again um, um, say to the hundreds of participants that are here today, in case you have questions or comments, please do so writing in the chat. And then after the panel two, we are going to have a dedicated time for question and answers. So please do put your question there, and I have my colleagues that are taking notes of them, and, uh, and, uh, and then we will come back to that. Uh, and just for curiosity for the participants here, um, uh, we had an impressive number of people that registered to the point that we had to, to stop the registration link to make sure that we would not face any technical challenge. This number went beyond 800 uh, registrations and would have been easily gone beyond the 1,000 participants. So this is remarkable, I must say. All right, so let's go to, to, to Teresa Martinez uh, to briefly present the, her first version of the graphic recording. As you can see, uh, um, I don't uh, even dare to kind of try to explain anything at the moment, uh, then later on we are going to have a, a short uh, uh, explanation from, from Teresa, uh, but this is just to show what is happening here behind the scenes, uh, and uh, so quickly and so impressive, put all those words, translate them into all those, um, all those easy to learn and to capture and to be made even more insightful uh, uh, visual uh, representation. Teresa, thank you so much. We are going to come back uh, to this straight after our second uh, panel. So, moving then to our second panel, mental health and psychosocial support in the context of displacement and mixed migration. Uh, we, I would like to delve into the diverse aspects of migration and displacement, acknowledging that in the recent years, the flow of migrants and displaced persons through South and Central America, as well as the Caribbean, has significantly escalated. The increase is attributed to the, to the security, the political, social, and economic deterioration in several countries within the region. Remarkably, the Latin American and Caribbean region hosts a substantial numbers of uh, migrants per capita compared to any other region. Currently, there are 18.4 million registered refugees, asylum seekers, displaced individuals, and stateless people in the region. And that's where we are going, that's the context we are going to now debate and have a conversation and learn from our speakers. We have here uh, four speakers from three different organizations. I want to very warmly uh, again welcome each of you, uh, Glenny Sanchez and uh, Jesus Raldo Fernandez from Handicap International, connecting from Colombia. It's really exciting to see uh, my neighbors here uh, um, uh, in this event. I also would like to welcome uh, Icaro Lavoziar da Silva Marcolino uh, from Brazil, uh, UNICEF Brazil. Uh, muito bom te ver aqui, uh, Icaro. Uh, and also Consuelo, Consuelo Castaneda de Ayala, advisor at GIZ, uh, uh, a regional program uh, alternatives uh, based in Honduras, for El Salvador, and Guatemala as well. Welcome for the four of you. It's really great to have you here. Uh, and uh, if I can start uh, the second panel inviting, asking you, Consuelo, uh, based uh, on your work in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, could you tell us about driving reasons of the displacement? How does displacement affect mental health and psychosocial well-being of persons on the move and the returnees, especially children? Could you tell us about how the Alternativas program uh, addressed those challenges? 
And uh, Consuelo, just before you answer this question, I want to really to reinforce to my four uh, dear colleagues here to be a little bit mindful about the time. Huh? Uh, and thank you very much, Consuelo, for being here. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Or perhaps um, I could just uh, talk about um, various um, reasons for um, displacement. Um, looking particularly at El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras, these are countries which at the same time are countries of transit, of uh, origin, and also receive um, uh, migrants. And uh, the uh, META group looks at um, young people and uh, their um, families. We have um, identified as m some of the main factors and the main reasons for um, displacement um, the conditions of uh, living in the particular country and opportunities for employment. Um, the, the people concerned um, are often in a very poor situation. Um, uh, they can be in despair. Often they don't have um, their basic needs met in terms of health, housing, education, care. And um, there's also a, a lot of exclusion, um, for example, from the education system, um, uh, there are often difficulties um, in schooling, and difficulty in um, uh, having access to um, uh, jobs, and um, there can be family impact as well. You can have the disintegration of families, you can have um, violence within the family, and um, uh, uh, cases where the dynamics within the family are causing a lot of distress and, and um, where um, the employment situation can also have a serious impact. And the conditions um, which develop here can lead to irregular migration. Um, so we have to think often in terms of um, uh, structures, um, looking, for example, at um, uh, violence, at uh, criminal gangs, and uh, often the issue of um, gender-based violence as well. Uh, we have, for example, often forced recruitment of men to um, participate in uh, gangs. And in the case of women, um, there's often um, sexual uh, abuse, some um, sexual violence, etc. And um, the development plan for um, children, um, girls, boys and adolescents uh, tries to address this type of violence. And um, the young people who are uh, subject to these um, various um, conditions can really um, suffer <clears throat> In um, uh, psychological terms, um, they often um, have uh, clinical symptoms. Um, they show uh, emotional problems. Sometimes you have um, attempts at suicide, etc. And it's not just um, problems which they face um, in their uh, places of origin. Also during transit, while they're on the move, they face problems in the country of um, the reach. There can be problems and also in the case of returns as well. There are many, many sources of stress. They have to um, face many crises um, and often traumatic um, conditions. And for example, um, there, there can be a, a real uh, lack of um, um, uh, psychosocial support um, um, on the, the routes, etc. So in this context, Alternativas has tried to uh, come up with an uh, inclusive approach for psychosocial support, looking for educational opportunities or support for work. 
and also ensuring a multi-layer um, support in um, regional and uh, national terms. We try, for example, to provide opportunities um, for um, people to um, uh, recover and to um, reincorporate, um, reintegrate in the families and communities. Thank you so much, Consuelo, uh, for 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 your points um, in bringing this reality to our attention um, directly from this perspective in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And now I I I, I invite you, um, Glenny Glenny Sanchez and um, and uh, Jesus Geraldo, if you can share the the answer together. Uh, uh, would be great to be looking at uh, Handicap International, knowing that it's working in Colombia and in Peru with people on the move from different nationalities, as well as people with disabilities affected by armed conflict in Colombia. And uh, so based on, on your experience and your work, if you could tell us more about the challenge linked with, uh, with, with meaningful, meaningful including persons with disability and their caregivers into MHPSS services. How do you ensure that people on the ground, the front line uh, and uh, people, uh, they, they, they actually become uh, the driver's seats of the project, uh, ensure participation and ownership? Thank you for being here. Muy buenos días. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for inviting us to participate. I'm a community leader in Handicap International and a migrant. There are many challenges for migrants. You can't get access to mental health services if you don't have a permit to stay in the country concerned. And that's difficult for those people who need those services and for those providing the care. Often they don't have their basic needs met, including their psychological needs. So. Those are psychological needs that we all share as human beings. Those who are in an irregular situation are often covered by international programs for promoting health, helping them with sickness, also mental health such as uh, depression, psychosis. But sometimes these services are very costly and medication can be very expensive. And those who are caring for others end up with feelings of despair, great sadness, and, and many other things. Continuity of mental health services is another problem because they often come to an end at some point, and yet MHPSS should be ongoing. What solutions are there? Well, as part of Handicap International and as a migrant myself, I think we need to try to make sure that there is a, a global protocol for those services so that there's a paper trail if someone moves from one organisation to another. We shouldn't keep people waiting. We need to identify and talk to the individual because often they know the best way, they know the care that they best need. Handicap International does work on mental health for individuals, including refugees. Why not provide them with care within their own community? Wherever HI has this possibility, we provide resources to community leaders such as myself, who are migrants themselves, who then in turn look after other people. So this is a specific type of capacity building. So we provide MHPSS as part of humanitarian aid as well. And this is also something that uh, helps to foster community cohesion as well. If I could just add to what Jesus was just saying there, in our region, Handicap International uh, promotes inclusion of migrants, in particular those who have a disability, into society so that they are part of the National Health Service and that they are given the basic care and mental health care that they need. Resource building of healthcare workers, enabling them to identify the priority needs of these migrants is very important. Brief psychotherapy can be offered. 
making sure that people are able to consult the specialists that they need. And we also enter into agreements, uh, cooperation agreements with specialist institutes that can provide MHPSS. We do as much as we can to make sure that we give as varied forms of support as are necessary for mental health which can bring people's levels of stress and anxiety down, particularly for migrants. Training courses are offered, raising awareness and helping others to understand how important the mental health of the migrant population is. Children, women, men and in particular all of those migrants who have a disability for whom MHPSS is particularly relevant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesus and, uh, and uh, Glenis, for, for your contribution. And let me now come uh, to you, Icaro. Um, Icaro, from UNICEF Brazil. While speaking about Latin America, it's also important to refer to the challenge faced by the original people, the native people, which often face multiple barriers to access services. What are the specific challenges in ensuring cultural, appropriate and sensitive mental health and sexual support for this particular community? Welcome and it's really great to have you here. Bem-vindo. Olá, buenos dias. É, meu nome é Icaro Lavoisier, sou indígena de... Yes, hello. Um, I'm um, uh, from the indigenous population in Parama, uh, Brazil. I um, work for uh, UNICEF um, in promoting um, human rights and uh, support for children and adolescents uh, across the world. With regard to the specific challenges in order to um, guarantee the appropriate um, psychosocial um, and uh, mental health um, services. We have to take into account uh, linguistic and cultural aspects. Um, uh, indigenous um, young people in Venezuela um, have um, uh, difficulty in communicating um, because of um, uh, uh, language issues and cultural issues, and this um, exacerbates their feeling of isolation and um, is a further um, challenge. Another issue is the presence of uh, xenophobia. This can have um, a negative impact on self-esteem and mental health and in the um, healthy development of these um, children and young people. Um, like previous speakers, we would have a number of recommendations as well, specifically on how to provide mental health services, um, including um, those to um, the Indigenous peoples. Um, there could be um, policies followed in order to improve the health of Indigenous people, and um, it should be possible to provide um, support locally um, in rural areas. We have, for example, an example of um, the provision of such services in Horaima. We have a document about that, which um, is presented by uh, the elders of the indigenous um, people, which is um, basically one which uh, addresses um, the, the questions and um, looks at them in a differentiated way. There's an initial proposal, a working proposal, whereby the um, state should allow um, the indigenous people to um, uh, have differentiated um, mental health support. Um, uh, another uh, point, um, uh, we have um, linguistic and cultural sensitivities when it comes to mental health and psychosocial situation of young people. We have to provide appropriate situations and um, uh, provision of services addressing the mental health needs of indigenous peoples. We have to promote social integration and uh, recognize the rights of uh, children and others in the indigenous um, communities. We have, for example, um, uh, emergency situations in a number of countries. 
where we you have um migratory movements we have a special uh, space in various countries called super uh, uh, amigos we have a special space um where um children can um, obtain um psychosocial support which is culturally sensitive and i think this is really um very helpful in um providing um uh, a successful uh, provision of um, our work under our uh, services. Um, we have, for example, the situation of um, a, a child who uh, did not speak, wasn't able to um, uh, speak to other children or to adults. And through um, our uh, special um, uh, super um, system, um, this uh, young person was uh, uh, given some uh, activities and and it was possible for them to participate and um, we involved the leaders of the indigenous communities and this made it easier for the, the, the child to start to uh, communicate, who's able to talk to other um, children as well. And in the meantime, um, the child has been able to attend school and um, be integrated in classes. I, I was really moved by this situation. And uh, this is something which um, uh, can also uh, be extended to uh, schools in the school. So I'd just like to conclude by talking about the importance of um, culture and spirituality for um, indigenous um, communities. Traditional practices um, can really be a source of strength um, for um, um, psychosocial support. And um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and I hope you are going to come back uh, uh, to this final point of view. Mental health is about rights. Mental health is about uh, fighting exclusion, fighting poverty. So it's, uh, thank you for so much for bringing those, uh, highlighting those points here. We still have a few minutes, so are you there to come back with quick uh, questions? If you, the three of you, the four of you can, I would appreciate that. Uh, before we come with the conclusions of Dr. Otello uh, from the Caribbean region, which we'll be very excited to be introducing very shortly as well. Uh, maybe coming back to to you, Glenny Sanchez and Jesus, uh, on, on, on your experience, how the work of, um, uh, how the work uh, um, of humanity and inclusion can actually, um, can actually uh, help into the country, can contribute into the existing systems and the national capacity, institutional capacities um, on mental health and psychosocial support. So what are your lessons and your tips in this regard? Thank you. Yes, I think it's important for us to continue with training and other awareness raising operations, making sure that we draw attention to the importance of mental health within migrant individuals, in particular those who have a disability, specifically psychosocial uh, disabilities. And so that we just demystify some beliefs that persist when it comes to disability making sure that people with disabilities participate, that they are part and parcel of the different uh, fora that take decisions, that they are in those spaces, and that as humanitarian organisations, we ourselves continue to participate in those spaces. Closer to Health is one example where joint decisions are taken together with the disabled person. It's important also to do project planning, planning of activities together with the disabled person so that they really are suited to their needs also as migrants. Marcio, there was a question in the chat for us. So with your permission, I will just touch on psychosocial services being provided to people who are only in the country or the region for a very short period of time. Yes, we are making sure that those 
who provide services to those who are in transit moving from one country to another have the tools that they need need in order to support those individuals emotionally and perhaps connect them up with people in other countries of our regions so that there's continuity. So if a process is initiated, let's say, in Peru or Colombia or Venezuela or Bolivia, then the person is on the move that that is continued in the other country they go to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenny, for, for, for this and Jesus as well. Um, and uh, from your side, Consuelo, would you like to bring uh, um, your perspective, uh, would you like to react to this same question? How do we link it with existing national and institutional local capacities when doing image process interventions? The well, um, yes, uh, our um, uh, program Alternativas looks at sustainability and we're always looking for a linkage with um, institutions at different levels and ensuring um, connection between those institutions as well. And it, it's necessary in order to establish um, the links between these various levels that um, you um, uh, are clear about um, the um, benefit of what you're providing. Um, it has to be something which um, will allow uh, the various levels to um, uh, connect and interconnect and uh, create synergy. And as we've seen, there's a lot, um, it's a lot to do with um, building together. We have to build up services together because um, we provide support, but the institutions um, also um, maintain these um, systems and programs. So we have to um, clarify the possibilities. It's essential that we um, build together with institutions. We have to ensure that what we do is a contribution and uh, within this process it's important that um, people are empowered and they, they feel part of it. Um, we have um, really focused very much on the four um, uh, comments um, um, uh, strength and uh, derivation for example. We really have to look at uh, um, the fact that the institutions may have certain weaknesses, but we have to focus on how they can work together and come up with an approach which is more sustainable to address image uh, PSS in um, uh, the population. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Consuelo. And, uh, and then if uh, we could start uh, uh, finishing this panel by inviting you, Kai Ikaro. I really would like to continue the last point you actually started. I'm a mental health professional from Brazil, so I was trained under the, the, the different schools of mental health. Um, I have worked overseas so many times, and I'm very much interested to hear from your experience uh, what you, you started concluding in your initial presentation when it comes to mental health and culture and spirituality at the center of it, more or less. If you can continue this telling us specific recommendations that you have in this regard, we would very much appreciate it. In terms of the work that is done as part of this UNICEF, project. It's a special space. We try to be very sensitive and it's mental health work that we're doing for indigenous refugee children in particular. It's important for the state to provide appropriate psychosocial services. And this is essentially a matter for the state, but we're also working in this field, so we try to link up with the professionals, making sure that there is uh, a special treatment being provided to children. 
It's important to understand indigenous culture and traditions. It, that's a type of social inclusion, raising awareness also of the rights of indigenous refugee children. So this work focuses on the value of that culture, acknowledging its value and acknowledging the importance of spirituality in the indigenous culture. Because this is something that can have an important impact on the mental health of indigenous people. So in that work, we consult the community at all times. We reach out to leaders in those communities. so that we are working together with state authorities, helping them to understand the traditional practices, traditional cultures, which can help to strengthen people's uh, psychosocial health. Children really need our support, so it's important work. Thank you. No mental health without starting from the culture, from the local reality. Thank you so much, uh, Icaro, for reminding us that uh, this crucial aspect. And sometimes we are in a position to be telling the decision makers the obvious, right? Um, that's the, 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 the first initial entry point. Thank you so much, Glenny Sanchez, Consuelo, Jesus, Icaro from UNICEF, GIZ, Humanitarian International. Uh, you're not leaving because we're going to have questions and answers very soon. But I just want now to invite uh, Dr. Otello from, from a very uh, particular country in the Caribbean region, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I'm so happy to have uh, you here today. Uh, Dr. Otello is the head of the mental health in the Ministry of Health in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, she will be concluding this session. She has been a, a, a critical person uh, in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago uh, in, in making sure that uh, both policy, uh, policy making and programming on their mental health and sexual support are present. So she's one of the most uh, remarkable advo advocates for this uh, in our region. And I would like to invite you to conclude, uh, to reson to conclude the, 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 the speech, but as well as how this resonates in the context of Caribbean uh, region, in particular Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Dr. Otello. And thank you, Marcio, for the wonderful opportunity to share today. Uh, and I would like to first summarize what was shared so that we can all remember the important points that were made. Uh, Consuelo spoke from her work in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And she gave us a very insightful discussion of the Alternativas program. I hope I got it right. My Spanish is not 100% where it should be. <laughs> Anyway, um, you know, she spoke about those countries being countries of origin as well as receiving countries for migrants and discussed the types of difficulties faced in terms of poor living conditions and adversity faced by migrants in these countries and the lack of things like basic services, health, housing, education, and of course the role of violence in making these lives so difficult. She, therefore, she then spoke about her program and its inclusive approach to providing multi-layered support as she described it, so that people can enjoy recovery and reintegration. So I'm really thankful for her, her contribution this morning. She was followed by Glenis and her colleague from Handicapped International, and they highlighted the basic needs that are often unmet in migrants and other um, persons facing such difficulties. They, what was interesting was they highlighted something that we don't always remember, and that is caregiver fatigue. Yes, the people who provide care also need to be cared for. Uh, they spoke about the importance of migrants having documents, identification, and things like that to make their passage through different countries more difficult and their stay in countries where they seek amnesty less difficult. And of course, the need for mental health and psychosocial support within their communities, promoting inclusion, 
and providing care. And then we had Icaro from UNICEF, a very wonderful presentation highlighting the importance of focusing on indigenous peoples and in particular children in indigenous communities. And he was very, very uh, emphatic about the role of speaking to the elders, not assuming that we know what they need or how to provide it, but speaking to indigenous elders and getting their feedback so we're in a better position to provide that liaison between state agencies and indigenous community and indigenous, indigenous persons, particularly indigenous refugee children. So this was a really good presentation this morning. And um, I was also asked to speak a little bit about the Caribbean perspective. And in the Caribbean, we have a number of non-governmental organizations that do provide support and assistance to migrants who find themselves within the various Caribbean territories. In Trinidad and Tobago, for instance, we have the Living Waters Community, a Roman Catholic non-governmental organization that provides tremendous support. They have bilingual language speakers who assist with um, persons who do not speak English, English, which is the first language in Trinidad and Tobago. And then there are other organizations such as the Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross who also provide such services. Um, to tie in with the previous presentation, we also have a number of non-governmental organizations that provide support to persons who are victims of intimate partner violence or other forms of violence. And a number of helplines are available. There's a national domestic violence helpline, and there there is other there are other helplines, including one that is actually provided by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. They have a victim and witness support unit, which provides support to both victims and witnesses of violence. So thank you for the opportunity to share today, and I hope I have been helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Otello, for uh, the remarkable conclusions for this panel, too. Um, and uh, stay still with us, because I think there is one uh, interesting question here that uh, would probably come, uh, uh, would be quite helpful to have your, your inputs as well. Um, now we are coming, let me just be sure that, yes, we are coming to the Q&A session. Um, thank you for those that have uh, uh, put their questions in the chat. My colleagues have, uh, have uh, selected, curated some of them and put here, and I will be inviting opportunity. If, uh, we have space just for uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if I can invite all my colleagues from the two panels uh, to come on board now, um, turn your cameras on, um, and uh, we can have a quick uh, overview of everyone, and uh, you, I can address the questions to the different panels. Uh, there is one particular question. Uh, if it's possible to, that was made by Cristina Finocchiaro, um, uh, to Tinta Violetta, um, to Mrs. Urban. I uh, just want to make sure that she, she's able to hear me and see me and she's around. If you are, if you, are, if you can unmute yourself. All right, so let's perhaps go to, we can come, that, come back to this question. Um, and since I see you, Dr. Otello, I will address this, the question that I saw here that would be quite uh, related. There is a relevant question here from Samantha Dixon related to how do we engage governments in general, no? and, and here I'm amplifying the, the discussions about GBV, but also MHPSS in displacement and, and uh, mixed migration and so on. So the big, uh, your big role in this, what can you share in terms of tips and, and ways of approaching governments when, it's commonly, when it comes to actively engage them in those hard talks and hard policy making process? 
Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, it has not been difficult to engage government in uh, understanding the need for mental health and psychosocial support. Because at the beginning of the pandemic, we had no MHPSS in Trinidad and Tobago. But we very quickly realized the need to establish a technical working group. And um, the rapidly increasing need for mental health support and psychosocial support made it very easy for us to engage with government and um, get the support that was needed to get that off the ground. And it is still up and running today. Um, in our country, fortunately, at this time, we have a Minister of Health who is very, um, very, very enthusiastic about mental health. He's passionate about mental health. And therefore, um, he ensures that mental health services receive the attention that's required and that, in fact, mental health is included in all discussions about um, prevention and pr promotion with regard to non-communicable diseases. So the mental health team works collaboratively with the NCD, Non-Communicable Disease Unit, in the ministry. Um, I know in some countries, um, political will can be a challenge, but um, I think it's about how we approach it, not in an adversarial manner, but in a in an engaging manner, highlighting for government leaders what the benefits to them look like. In other words, how does the country benefit from what we would like to do? Um, because at the end of the day, if we don't justify things, we don't get government expenditure and government support for it. So the important is it's really important to have a strong justification and communicate that in a clear manner, but in a non-combative manner that helps them to see that it's a win-win situation for the country, for the politician, and for the mental health team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Otello. Um, I, I would like to now, I think you, you are, you can hear me now? And um, I would love to to hear your the question that there is a question that has been addressed to you related to how often violent behavior is transmitted and replicated between generations inside of a family and also in cultural structures. Do you have uh, any insights or lessons that uh, or examples or ideas that that work in, on interrupting these transmissions? of violence and what can you share about uh, this understanding of violence as something that is transmitted across cultures and even between families as well and how to address and, 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 uh, and how to address those issues? Um, this is Urban. Just checking if you if you are able to hear my question. I, I'm I'm not sure if you're muted. You sound muted here for me. Ahora. Yes. You can. Yes, we can hear now. That's. A difficult one to uh, answer. We're talking about centuries of um, a patriarchal culture across the, the globe, uh, really. And how can you um, interrupt the circle there? Um, it's complex. It requires a, a complex approach. So it, it um, starts in the uh, early years uh, of life and um, education and um, gender uh, identification. Um, we have to educate um, children at school, at primary school, secondary, um, through communication, um, through the media, and all public policy has to raise awareness um, of um, the different types of um, identity in the society. And um, 
the validation of violence is a, a, an even more difficult problem. Um, and this is something which applies at all levels, not just the national one. So it's really um, very uh, difficult because um, it's been impossible to have a violence perpetrated for centuries because of this mentality. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Urban. Let me now uh, invite uh, Ikaro. Ikaro, can you hear me? Yes, great, fantastic. I think. Excellent. Uh, a question here, um, and perhaps uh, if we still have time, I will ask Maria to also comment on it. It's a question related to how how do we approach, uh, what are you experiencing, how to approach the discussion about gender-based violence uh, in indigenous communities or the, the, the native uh, people? que también hacíamos un trabajo con lo So we work essentially with children but as part of their overall community. So we provide specific services to the women within these indigenous communities and giving them differentiated treatment, listening to them when they talk to us about their culture and their traditions so that we can really support these women and the girls within those communities, in particular where there's a migratory context as well. The work that we do in promoting mental health looks at indigenous and traditional practices which actually strengthen the role of women within their communities. What we essentially do is listen to them so that they bring their questions to us. So that we are really working together. And then we collect those questions and we take them to the state authorities. So that they can give the, the right uh, attention to Indigenous women and girls within schools, within other governmental uh, bodies that offer psychosocial support. So we consult the people within the community itself to see what their specific needs are and then we pass that information on to the professionals in the field and I think that does contribute. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Icaro. Unfortunately, I just realized here that we are right on time, so I have to move on now to the to the concluding parts. Um, uh, just before I do so, um, thanking a lot the panelists of the the, the two panels, uh, uh, brothers and sisters from Latin America and the Caribbean region. Um, it's a it's a very special moment as well for me as a person that has been in this field for so many years, uh, living part, especially in Asia, and Africa, and Middle East countries to be see, to be able to witness and participate on, on such an uh, event uh, in our Latin America and Caribbean region, especially because we have a lot to share. We have a lot that uh, are, uh, are 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 here to really speak up and bring up for for practice, experience, knowledge that we also have to share. Uh, in, and coming now to, to starting the concluding remarks, I'm, uh, I'm extremely happy here to welcome and to introduce Dr. Mariana Moreno, uh, the National Director for Mental Health and Substance Use from the Minister of Health in Argentina, uh, that will will uh, uh, be able to provide us some uh, information about the forthcoming uh, fifth Global Mental Health Summit in Buenos Aires that is happening in October this year. Uh, and she will be followed by Dr. Pablo de Griff uh, from the New York University. He's the head of the Prevention Project and the Transitional Justice Program. Uh, he was the, from 2012 to 2018, the UN Special Rapporteur for the Promotion of Truth, 
justice, reparation, and guarantees of no recurrency. Um, Dr. Mariana Moreno, it's very nice to have you here. Welcome, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Marcio. And I'd like to uh, thank those who've organized this webinar on um, uh, MHPSS and emergencies and disasters. And we'd like to um, say thank you for inviting us to present um, the 2023 Global Mental Health Summit, which is to take place in the Kirchberg Center in um, Buenos Aires on the, the 5th and 6th of October. It's very important um, for us to have the opportunity to share with uh, other countries in our region to invite them to participate in this summit. And of course, I'm inviting you all on behalf of our Minister for Health, um, uh, Carla Bisotti, who is very interested in um, having a participation uh, by everyone in this. And um, we're very pleased to have this um, global summit uh, in our country. The focus will be on mainstreaming mental health in all policies. And we will have um, presentations about the complexity of um, uh, mental health uh, care. And we'll be looking at um, the possibility to um, talk and bring together different instances within the state and civil society in order to um, design uh, public policies which address the complex needs of the population in terms of mental health. Um, we always have um, uh, uh, mental health of a community um, as um, the background to this, it, the idea that this is uh, of concern to everyone. And um, as I say, on the 5th and 6th of October, this will be taking place. It, it will be a high-level opening, an inaugural conference on mental health in all policy areas. There will be two main plenary sessions, one uh, regional and one um, thematic. And the uh, summit will bring together ministers for health from all across the world, as well as experts, representatives of organisations, of users, uh, civil service organisations, who will all provide their own perspective to the various um, plenary sessions and thematic um, groups. Um, we'll be looking at um, community intervention in uh, mental health, uh, how that applies in all policy areas, MHPSS in mandates and um, national budgets, um, and a focus on the key role of the various um, elements of um, mental health and the need for um, resources for allowing access to the health system and uh, shifting from a, an institutionalized system to one where people are um, uh, cared for more in the community. And I would invite you to have a look at the website uh, for the summit, which you'll uh, find in the QR code on the screen at the moment. You can um, have a look there to find um, uh, all the various aspects of the uh, meeting. And um, we look forward to welcoming as many people as possible to the Global Mental Health Summit in Argentina. Thank you very much. Primero la gente. Thank you very much, um, very much Dr. Mariana Moreno. Um, and um, look forward for this event uh, in October this year. And now I invite you, Dr. Pablo de Grief. Welcome. It's really nice to have you here with us. Um, to where I invite you to reflect on the role of MHPSS for prevention, response to violence, and intradition justice process, concluding this um, uh, webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcio. And before I proceed, I just want to make sure that uh, you can hear me all right. 
Okay, thank you. So first, uh, let me thank uh, the organizers for the very kind invitation. Uh, uh, this is a topic uh, on which I do not consider myself uh, an expert in the sense of uh, having professional training, but to which I am very attached uh, because in the course of 30 years of work uh, doing transitional justice, including, as you mentioned, as uh, the first UN Special Rapporteur, uh, the importance of the topic became very, very clear to me. I am not going to preach to the converted, nor try to assume a position of professional expertise that I do not have. I just want to offer some reflections from the standpoint of someone who has participated in transitional justice processes for a very long time and that has met the importance of the topic in different perspectives, hoping that the reflections may be of uh, some uh, use to you. Uh, I have always been very deeply convinced uh, about uh, the old uh, sociological argument uh, that sustainable social change is not simply a question of uh, institutional engineering, but that it involves changes of many kinds in different spheres. It, of course, involves changes in economic opportunities, but it also involves changes in societal relations, the way that people relate to one another. It involves some cultural changes, but very importantly for this conversation, Sustainable social change also involves uh, uh, changes in the domain of personal dispositions. And uh, this is where I locate uh, the sphere of uh, mental health and psychosocial support. I must say that one of the clearest uh, experiences for the deep need and the great importance of the topic in my professional experience had to do with my work in Burundi. When I learned that all of the leaders of the council that ruled the party in power, the same day, were people whose parents had been killed in previous rounds of violence in the country, my understanding of Burundian politics changed uh, completely. Because a party that is ruled by people with this type of experience, of course, is unlikely to behave as a regular political party would behave not the least because its uh, perceptions of risk, for example, would inevitably be affected by the experiences that all the members of the ruling council had uh, encountered in previous rounds uh, of uh, their life, and particularly in the experiences of laws uh, that they encountered. And therefore, this was a small window into an understanding of what it would take to make progress in Burundian politics, a context in which, of course, at the time when I was working there, there was very little mental health and psychosocial support on offer and one that leaders, political leaders, did not think of standing in need of. So this is perhaps the greatest uh, uh, reflection that I can offer in the minute that I have uh, left. This is a topic that is becoming increasingly important not the least because of the support of countries like the Netherlands and others. I was very glad to hear about the World Summit that Argentina is organizing. 
There is still, in my experience, a great deal that needs to be done in order to systematize and to upscale the offer that is available uh, to victims and uh, to others. So right now, for example, I am uh, one of the commissioners in the United Nations uh, Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine. And of course, the need for mental health and psychosocial support in Ukraine is absolutely immense. Uh, but uh, the offer is not nearly sufficient to meet uh, the demands. So the last point, in addition to uh, finding out about strategies to upscale uh, the offer, is also to think about different constituencies that are not always thought of and different processes in which mental health is important. Uh, there is some literature and, and some experience on uh, the participation of victims and the support for victims uh, in uh, criminal justice procedures, but even there it is not nearly as rich and as consistent as one would uh, desire. Victims are still treated largely as sources of evidence and testimony and their needs are not always uh, even attempted to be met. In uh, truth-telling processes, for example, there is also some interesting experiences, but insufficiently systematic and, insu and of insufficient scale. In the domain of reparations, for example, there is less uh, uh, systematic experience about how to provide it. But the final point that I want to make in addition to a plea for upscaling and for systematicity has to do with more imaginative ways of thinking about work with the stakeholders that are not direct participants in transitional justice processes, but that would clearly need and profit from this kind of support. And these are people that had participated in conflict, even perpetrators, but also political leadership at different levels, because it is clear that, for example, in a conflict like Ukraine, there is no one who would be exempted from the need to get the type of support that we are talking about here. So I am going to stop with an invitation to think about expanding the scope of your work, which is a way of reaffirming its importance and my own desire to keep on defending its importance in different forums and profiting from the work of the real professionals and those are gathered in your meeting. So thank you very much, Marcio. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. And uh, I am looking forward to learning more about uh, the results of the meeting from all of you. Dr. Pablo, thank you so much. Uh, one of the basic and flags we have uh, in our region here is, is that mental health, there is no mental health without justice. And, uh, and a human rights-based uh, approach is the is the core step, the core stone of uh, any mind thinking of mental health uh, systems and interventions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pablo, for all the great uh, uh, conclusion remarks.